Um, welcome everybody to the CNI and thank you all for coming. It's my great pleasure to introduce Matt Plummer, who has uh, been uh, on the schedule to give a talk for many, many months. And finally, we get to, we get to hear him speak. He's split between um, Sussex and the University of Kent. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about um, his work with memory and EEG. So over to you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so this, um, uh, this body of work is from my PhD, which I have just recently uh, finished and wrapped up at the University of Kent. Uh, so the kind of the background to the project. Um, so episodic memory, I'm sure as we all know, uh, involves us being able to remember personal events from our past. Now, when we remember these types of memories, it isn't just a simple uh, snapshot or video playback of how an event actually happened, but retrieval is an active process that can actually update and modify episodic memories. And this is uh, emphasized uh, quite well with a, uh, an effect called the retrieval practice effect. So in this uh, type of design, uh, participants, split into three different groups basically. Um, in a study phase participants will learn uh, a list of items or a list of objects or they may view a video, something to form a memory. After this in what I'll refer to as a refresh task, um, participants can either complete a test i.e. actively try and remember the information that they encountered during a study phase They'll complete a distractor task where they don't encounter the information from the study whatsoever. They just do a crossword or a, an, an irrelevant task. Or they would do a, a restudy task. So they review the information from the study phase and they're given an opportunity to study this again. After these refresh tasks, participants then complete uh, what I'll call a final test. So in all of these three different conditions, uh, participants will actively try and remember the information that they've learned during the study phase. And typically, um, the effect, uh, this retrieval practice effect shows that in this final test, participants' uh, accuracy uh, for events is better if they completed a test during the refresh task compared to uh, doing the distractor or the restudy task. Um, so it also goes that, say, any information or any kind of uh, erroneous details that are presented during this refresh task, um, the chances of participants falsely remembering that false information again during the final test is also enhanced uh, after in this, in this initial condition here, the test condition compared to the other two. Um, generally, though, the problem with this paradigm and these types of tasks is that the strength of items between retrieval and restudy conditions in particular is not matched. So in that the items that are in this initial condition, the, the test condition, um, some of those items participants will successfully remember. And these are what we call refer to as strong memories because they're memorable. However, information in the restudy task um, in this paradigm, the correct information is always reinforced for every type of memory. So we've always, we're always reinforcing correct information during restudy, but not all of the time is correct information reinforced during test. So that's what we mean by these tasks aren't matched. Um, so to overcome this problem um, and the study of the my experiments are based on is a study from Bridge and Voss in 2014. So in their paradigm, they had two blocks of tasks. Uh, in the first block, participants did a study phase where they just learned the location of objects on a screen. They then completed a active refresh task. So this was a cued recall task where objects were presented in the middle of the screen and the participants just had to actively recall and drag the object to a location they thought they could remember from the study phase. After that, they then did a recognition task. So they're presented with uh, the same object in three possible locations. Um, the original 
location that was from the study phase, location they remembered in the refresh task, and then a, a neutral third option. And they just have to pick which one they think was the correct location. Um, so they complete those three tasks first at first, and then in a second block, um, a similar design. So there's a study phase again, where they learn some different object locations. They then have this passive refresh task. So here we can see that there's a yellow box and in this task, uh, the participants were told to place the object at this predetermined location. And we can see in this diagram that the location of these yellow boxes is based on the locations that the participants remembered in the preceding active refresh task. So in this way, the number and the size of the errors made in this passive refresh task is matched equally to those in the active refresh task. Um, after the passive task, they just complete the same recognition test. And even when we, uh, even when Bridge and Pal, uh, Bridge and Voss, sorry, were controlling for uh, this issue I've identified in matching between these two types of tasks they still find that uh, following active refresh, participants are more likely to select the incorrect ob object location, uh, i.e. the refresh location, compared to in the passive task where participants are more likely to select the correct original location. So um, the remaining questions that uh, are left from this study is that we, we can ask whether uh, this type of design <clears throat> and this effect also applies to the updating of what I refer to as simpler memories. So i.e. memories or items that have minimal semantic content or information, i.e. an apple has a lot of semantic information because we know it's a fruit, we know it's, it can be red or green, we know it grows on trees and that they taste quite good. Um, but what about memories without that semantic information? And what about memories that prior to the initial study phase, you've never seen before, you've never encountered that information before. Um, and there's a good type of stimulus that we can use for that, which I'll go on into in just a second. What we also wanted to test as well was whether the type of retrieval task also has an influence on memory updating. So in this type of design, this is a queued recall based design where retrieval is uh, more effortful and requires a more uh, a sort of a, a, a deeper search into memory to be able to remember these locations compared to say much simpler tasks such as a recognition task where participants just have to look at an information and say whether they've seen that before. Um, so we were what we were focused on looking at recognition based uh, updating of memories. And in particular, uh, we're using face memory. So this is, as I said, uh, a stimulus set that we can use where participants would never have seen a face before by using unfamiliar faces. The faces that they've never seen before, therefore they have no semantic, no prior exposure to these types of memories. Um, so that kind of ticks a box in this way of, use, of controlling for the semantic content of the memory. But it's also important from a applied perspective in that um, in an eyewitness testimony procedure, uh, it's important that we understand the conditions in which face memories of a suspect's face, i.e. a person who views a crime and sees a suspect commit a crime who they've never met before, how does their memory for that particular face update or modify throughout repeated procedures of trying to remember the face that they've seen? So though those different reasons motivated um, this collection of studies. Um, so yeah, so it's unclear, um, you know, that there's some evidence based on uh, applied research that suggests that these types of face memories can become modified and updated through repeated retrieval and exposure, but it's not 100% clear um, whether retrieval versus restudy, this task manipulation influences uh, memory updating uh, to, to a different degree. 
we also wanted to uh, account for in these set of experiments an effect called the self-choice effect. So this is related to the Bridge and Voss study in the previous slide. Um, we wanted to control for this effect of self-choice, i.e. there's a, a big difference between a retrieval task where participants can select the memory based on, uh, select information based on their own memory compared to a restudy task where they're given something to to learn and memorize for a later task. Uh, and that, that having that choice, having the ability to choose the information rather than have it being given to you has been shown in studies from Murti et al to really uh, influence your memory for that information later on. So that's also a factor that we wanted to control for in these experiments. So three experiments were conducted overall, um, all behavioral experiments for now. Um, in the first experiment, uh, well, I should say, all three experiments had a similar design like this. So there was two blocks of tasks, a learning refresh final recognition task. Um, the learning phase, so it's in experiment one, um, the first block, there was a learning phase where the participants were presented with 30 faces to memorize. They then had a refresh recognition task where they were presented with 20 trials. Uh, in each of those trials, there was one target face from the learning phase alongside four distractor faces that weren't from the learning phase. And they just had to pick out which, which one of those five faces they remembered from the learning task. They then did a similar task in the final recognition task. Uh, they're shown the five faces again, they just have to pick which face they remember from learning. Uh, in block two for experiment one, a similar procedure where they would learn 30 different faces. They then have this restudy task where they're told which one of the five faces they should memorize for the later recognition, the final recognition task. Uh, and then during this final recognition task, they're told to ignore the face that they learned from the refresh restudy task and try and remember those from the learning phase. So this was our initial experiment and we conducted two follow up experiments to this to um, to ensure that our manipulation was getting into a retrieval induced updating effect rather than alternative explanations, which I'll get onto in a minute. So experiment two, um, as you can see, the two blocks were identical in that during the refresh task, uh, in both blocks, participants completed a recognition task. So uh, this, this experiment was conducted to control for any order effects that we found uh, in the first experiment. Um, the third experiment was then accounted for the self-choice. So uh, in the first block, participants had a rating task during the refresh phase. So importantly, um, what they were shown five faces and the participants were asked to choose the face that was most distinctive out of those five. There was still one target and four distractors, but they were, they were never told, you know, try and remember the target face. They were just told pick the distinctive face. Um, and then after they completed those trials, they then did the final recognition task where they were told to remember again, the face from the learning phase. Uh, the, in the, the second block for experiment three was uh, in the refresh test was this restudy task. So they're given a face to choose um, and uh, to memorize for the later final recognition phase. So across all these three different experiments, then we have different hypotheses and predictions um, to account for the extent to which participants are biased during the final recognition task by the faces that they picked in the previous refresh task. Uh, our retrieval hypothesis would suggest that um, this measure of bias or memory updating is high oops, is higher following the recognition compared to the restudy and the rating tasks during refresh. An order effects hypothesis uh, would suggest that the bias measure is always higher in block one compared to block two for all three experiments. 
We also have a self-choice hypothesis whereby the bias measure should be higher following the recognition tasks at refresh and this rating task at refresh compared to the restudy tasks. So I've mentioned this bias measure just to briefly explain uh, how we calculated that measure as an indication of the extent to which participants' memory for the faces were updated by the information that they encountered during the refresh phase. So this bias difference score, um, as we can see here, indicates uh, the proportion of incorrect bias deducting the proportion of incorrect non-bias. So for each trial, we consider this an incorrect biased response based on the fact that if participants selected a distractor face during the refresh task, and then they picked the exact same face during the final recognition task, that's a biased response because they are biased during the final recognition phase to pick the same incorrect error that they, uh, that they selected during the refresh task. We have an incorrect non-bias <coughs> measure as well. So the proportion of trials where participants picked a distractor during the refresh phase, the re proportion of those trials where they then went on to select a different distractor during the final recognition task. So then this bias difference score, incorrect bias minus incorrect non-bias, a positive score suggests that participants were more likely to pick the same errors again during refresh and final recognition, uh, whereas negative score suggests that they were more likely to select a different error during the final recognition task. So <clears throat> across the three experiments, we have this proportion bias difference score uh, for experiment one, two, and three split by the two blocks that we had in those experiments. So just to break this down uh, a little bit, um, in the first experiment, we can see that the bias difference score was significantly higher in block one compared to block two. Remember that in experiment one, the refresh task in block one was a retrieval task. The refresh task in, in block two was this restudy task. So this suggests that retrieval has increased the updating of these face memories compared to restudy. We then have experiment two. So experiment two was this, was designed to account for an order effect. So we had a retrieval task during the refresh phase in both the blocks. And we can see here that there was no significant difference between these two uh, blocks in the, in the bias measure. We then finally wanted to uh, account for this self-choice effect in experiment three. So where the, the task during refresh was the rating task and the, ta uh, sorry, the, the, the task during block one refresh was the rating task and uh, in block two, it was this restudy task. And again, they weren't significantly different from one another. You can see here that the measures here are slightly lower than those seen uh, in experiment two when the refresh tasks were this retrieval task. Um, we also did uh, between experiment analyses, just to really emphasize whether this updating measure is enhanced following the retrieval task compared to restudy in the rating task. So what we do when we um, compare the bias difference score between um, the block one conditions between the, the, the experiments one and two and between experiments one and three. So between experiments one and two, where both the refresh tasks were this retrieval task, there's no significant difference in the bias score. But when we compare experiment one to experiment three, where we are then comparing updating after the retrieval task compared to updating after the rating task, we can see that there's a significant difference. Updating is higher following retrieval compared to the rating task. We then have, um, comparing block two between, exper between the experiments. So comparing block two between experiment one and two, where in experiment one, the task was the restudy, there's a the, the bias difference score was significantly lower in this experiment compared to experiment two, 
where the refresh task was the retrieval task. And then finally, um, comparing bias, the bias difference measure following the restudy task in experiment one compared to experiment three, we can see that there's no significant difference there. So overall, um, we have argued that this data suggests that face memory updating was enhanced following recognition-based retrieval judgments. Um, we ruled out an order effect uh, of, of block one always preceding block two. And we also accounted for this self-choice effect, i.e. Uh, it's not just the act of choosing information. There's something special about memory retrieval that enhances memory updating more so than the other tasks that we've been used. Um, so we, we can reason what kind of processes are, are going on in the brain to account for this uh, memory updating effect due to retrieval. So some arguments suggest that recognition enhances uh, the reactivation of memories. So there's an idea that during retrieval, the neural trace for an episodic memory is reactivated. Uh, and it's this reactivation period that allows for uh, an opportunity for that memory to become modified. Um, an alternative is that recognition just simply enhances the encoding of information that is picked during those refresh tasks by a attentional processing, um, possibly, and that this uh, intention, uh, this attentional enhancement uh, isn't it seen for the restudy or the rating tasks. Um, so to try and account for those different exclamations, we then conducted uh, an EEG experiment uh, with this paradigm. Um, but before I move on to that, uh, I said I would um, answer any questions related to those first few experiments before moving on to the EEG. Anyone's got any questions? <clears throat> Doesn't look like there are any. No. Cool. I'll move on then. So we have then conducted um, an EEG experiment uh, to get into the this sort of neural processing related to uh, this memory updating effects that we found. And the reason for EEG in particular is that um, this tool has a, a, a lot better temporal resolution. So we can hopefully try and unpick the order of processes that are going on. And in particular, oops, this was shown in a study by Bridge and Paler in 2012. So um, this, uh, the task that Bridget and Pala use, similar to the one I showed earlier, where they have this uh, spatial memory task. So the learning phase, um, objects, uh, participants learn several object locations. They then had um, in task two, a queued recall task. So they're presented with the object in the middle of the screen. They just have to recall the location that they remembered from the learning phase. They then have a similar, or, well, it, it, was a, it was the same task in task three, a to recall task, try and remember the, the location of the objects that they memorized during the learning phase. So with uh, this paradigm, um, the Bridge and Pala had two uh, approaches to measure neural activity corresponding to different cognitive processes. So for each of these trials, there are three locations that are uh, associated with each object. There is the study location. Um, so the location that the participants memorized initially. They then have the location from task two, i.e. their initial memory, the object location. And then they have the location at task three. So um, the, yeah, the location in this third task. Um, the initial uh, measure that they uh, analyzed then in correspondence to ERP activity is what they called current accuracy. So ERPs were measured during task two. So therefore they could um, 
compare neural activity between the uh, objects that were placed closer to their study location at task two compared to objects that were placed further away. Um, they then also had um, a measure of updating such that any activity during task two that predicted whether they would select a similar location in task three. And so this is indicated here, uh, separating uh, ERP conditions into those where task three locations were closer to task two and those where the task three was further away from task two. So we have these two measures of current accuracy during task two and future bias uh, corresponding to lo the locations in a future third task. And so we see here, uh, related to this current accuracy uh, measure, um, the ERPs between the uh, more accurate and less accurate objects were distinguished by a positivity from 400 to 700 milliseconds, which is roughly a time where uh, successful memory retrieval occurs. Um, this future retrieval bias contrast, however, was distinguished by a, a later effect. So ERPs were more positive during this late 700 to 1000 millisecond time window. They were more positive for the memories where participants would go on to make a similar error during task three compared to memories where participants would select a less uh, similar location between task two and three. So this kind of maps onto those arguments I suggested earlier. Um, updating could occur via a reactivation effect by retrieving and reactivating the memory. And it could be characterized by a, an encoding effect. So information is encoded uh, into long-term memory uh, and that information is remembered later on. Um, equally, like these two processes could act in, in sync with one another. Um, the data here suggests that uh, reactivation and encoding may be a separate process, um, but they, it, they could equally occur in sync. Um, anyway, so that task, that paradigm was one that we based our uh, EEG experiment on. So in this EEG experiment, we had a similar paradigm I presented earlier, um, a learning phase where participants learned several phase targets, uh, a refresh recognition task where Again, they're presented with five faces. One of them is a target from learning. The other four are the distractors. They just need to pick which face they remembered to be the target face. And then there's the final recognition task. Um, again, same task of trying to remember the faces from the learning phase. Um, so with this paradigm, again, what we could uh, look into is during this initial refresh task, what ERPs predicted subsequent recognition decisions, i.e. ERPs during the initial refresh phase for those trials where participants selected a similar face during final recognition compared to selecting a more dissimilar face during final recognition. And again, we can also look into this uh, measure of uh, accuracy, just based on the extent to which participants during the refresh task picked faces that were similar to or dissimilar from the targets shown during the learning phase. And again, based on this argument I've presented, reactivation related ERPs for successful retrieval should correspond to this uh, accuracy contrast, whereas encoding related activity for the faces selected during refresh should only should distinguish those uh, memories where a similar or dissimilar face is picked later on. So just to kind of break down trials uh, and the conditions we analyzed using ERPs. So overall, there was 100 repeated trials, i.e. 100 trials during the refresh task that participants were also presented to during the final recognition task. We split these trials based on accuracy. So did participants during the refresh task correctly pick the target or incorrectly pick a distractor? We then further split those two trial types into a close and a far bias condition. So a close bias condition um, suggests that 
in the final recognition task, participants selected a similar face to the target that they correctly picked during refresh. Correct far bias is the, those trials where participants selected a less similar face to that picked to the to the target pick during refresh. Same uh, kind of logic for the incorrect trials, uh, incorrect close bias, did participants select a similar distractor during the final recognition task, an incorrect far bias, did the participants select uh, a more dissimilar face to the error selected during refresh. So um, the ERP results then for test one, which is, uh, also known as this refresh task, the, the refresh recognition task. The ERPs in this uh, task generally corresponded to distinguishing between uh, correct and incorrect responses. So there was a positivity seen across the scalp for trials where participants correctly se selected targets compared to incorrectly selecting a distractor face. A similar pattern during test two as well was shown where ERPs were generally more positive for uh, target for correct compared to incorrect responses. But here there was uh, an, an interaction as well, such that ERPs were more positive for the correct uh, responses only for those trials where the participants selected a similar face during the preceding uh, test one task. So this kind of suggests that ERPs in this test two, um, where the correct information has been repeatedly selected, uh, th these ERPs represent a kind of a reactivation of strong memories that are, are durable and persist throughout the multiple tests. Um, and generally, yeah, the ERPs kind of give this indication that uh, they correspond to reactivation based um, measures of remembering uh, information correctly and remembering that information correctly across multiple retrieval attempts. Importantly, we found no kind of neural marker of memory updating with, with the ERPs, um, which was kind of <laughs> frustrating in a way because uh, we had kind of some strong predictions that we may have seen some kind of activity during the initial task that would have predicted what the participants pick in the later memory test. Um, we then kind of reason that the ERP measure reflects only a, a, a kind of just a, an aspect of, of neural processing. It reflects the evoked activity that in, in response to a, a stimulus time locked presentation of an event. Um, generally from lower frequency bands. However, there are alternative uh, neural markers that we can use to uh, apply to this paradigm and any paradigm in fact, and that's looking at um, oscillatory measures of activity. So we can look at oscillations based on the fact that they are both evoked or induced. Uh, so they're evoked to a stimulus being presented on the screen or they are induced by a top-down process occurring in the brain. So we also looked at uh, oscillatory activity in, response, in relation to this paradigm. So exact same paradigm, exact same trial combinations, but this time we are um, assessing the extent to which theta, alpha, and beta power differences occur between these different conditions. And so I'm just presenting the, um, the key results that we found. So um, in the alpha and beta bands, what we found was that um, there was a late alpha beta desynchronization. So there was a desynchronization for, of alpha and beta when participants correctly picked a target compared to incorrectly picking a distractor during the first test, generally at posterior electrodes as I said, quite late on during the epoch. However, we also found um, alpha beta synchronization a little bit earlier on at central parietal electrodes, such that there was more alpha beta synchronization for the correct close compared to the uh, correct far bias conditions. 
um, with no effects seen for the incorrect close bar conditions. In the second test, we found a theta alpha synchronization. So theta alpha power was larger for the uh, close versus far bias conditions. And this was evident for both correct and incorrect responses. So what we can kind of, uh, what we reason from this kind of data is that um, for these different effects is that the alpha beta desynchronization we argued reflected a, a subjective um, process related to, um, you know, it was, I, I strongly believe that I remember seeing this face compared to this face. Um, the mid alpha synchronization effects. So there's, a, there's an opinion that alpha and beta are uh, inhibitory oscillations. So a, a desynchronization of those uh, inhibitory oscillations kind of uh, enhances processing of, of, of information. Um, so for this mid alpha effect where alpha power was larger for the correct close compared to correct far bias conditions, we kind of reason that this may lead to a kind of an inhibition of competing information. So participants see a target face during the first test and they are uh, uh, therefore allocating more attentional resources to prioritize in the re-encoding of those target faces. Therefore, they are inhibiting distracting information. That argument needs a bit more substantiating by future studies where we are manipulating the extent to which there is retrieval competition. Um, and so then the, the the effects we found in test two, this early mid theta alpha synchronization, um, the theta effect in particular, theta is associated with memory retrieval typically. And it's in that kind of the time frame that we're talking about successful memory retrieval to occur. Now, because this was seen for both correct and incorrect um, responses where participants were selecting similar information between test one and two, we've argued that this could be a correlate of retrieving updated memories. So participants are retrieving those correct memories that they've remembered correctly previously, but they're also falsely retrieving updated memories that, that have been formed or where distractors have been falsely remembered during the initial task and they're subsequently remembered again in the second test. So um, that's just a partial summary of part of my PhD work. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about, as I said, either, either of those, uh, the behavioral or the EEG experiment. Um, and I thank you for listening. Thank no, you very much. The time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, 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 what might be a silly question. I don't know very much about these, you know, the, the frequency band stuff. Um, and when you say the, the synchronization and desynchronization of, of say alpha and beta, mm -hmm. my these are two different frequency bands. Mm -hmm. So they're what does it mean when they when they synchronize and desynchronize if they're at different frequencies? Um, I, I, yeah, yeah. So like they the different frequencies are in memory at least are characterized or typically associated with the different process. So um, yeah, the slower theta band, um, is the synchronization of that band is associated with successful, or well, is associated with memory retrieval. Um, whereas then the other, the oscillations, like I said, which are functionally thought to relate to a different kind of process, like such as inhibition, so well, you're just talking about an increase in power in each of those yeah. two, so they're completely separate. You're not talking about how how alpha synchronizes with beta. Oh yeah, sorry. So uh, yeah, I'm just referring to um, a synchronization or, or an increase in power of right. the theta band and an in, uh, increase or decrease in power of alpha and beta. Yeah, I, I see. I, I just got confused with the terminology. Okay. Yeah, Thank it's you. all we did for our studies was um, yeah focus on increase or decrease in the individual bands rather than cross frequency uh, 
activity. Yeah. I see. I see. Uh, it looks like the uh, the the one mind of the bird lab has a question. Um, would you like to type it, or would you like to try and use your microphone? Hi there. I think I can. I can. Yeah. That's good. Um, yeah. Good. Good talk. Um, I. So yeah. What I was wondering was, was with the the sort of straightforward testing effect with with prose materials and stuff. I think is is we normally think it's due to like elaborating semantic information. You kind of, if you're forced to, to retrieve something, then you um, create more so semantic associations with that or maybe personal relevance and stuff. And, and that helps you retrieve it because it sets up more cues to retrieve in the memory later. Um, when you're looking at things like faces, I mean, do you think that there's anything similar going on, or you, is it totally different? Are you getting a sort of sharper representation of, of the face? Well, yeah. I mean, it, we've we've thought a lot about this, and it, it could be one of many kind of explanations in that the the representation of the face uh, in the brain is itself enhanced or modified. Um, if, you know, if, if the updating effect is positive or negative, it could be that, yeah, multiple separate traces of the event are formed and uh, there's a competition between, um, say, if you've selected, uh, if, if you've encoded a distractor during the initial task, that memory competes with the memory of the target face that you've learned initially. It could equally be that. And, um, you know, we're not, we, we can't say for sure either way which of those accounts is is the case with this paradigm but um uh yeah it's something that we've thought a lot about <laughs> cool. Thanks. okay are there any more questions We've, we've got an extra question over here. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, can you can you go over explaining uh, what's the correct R and correct close? Like, if you have one correct response, why is one close and one is far? Sure. So, um, so yeah. So we for the, the for those trials in the refresh task where the the targets have been picked. So for all of those, say, um, 50 correct trials, um, 25 of those trials, participants in the next task two could select either the exact same target or a very similar distractor that is, is more similar in perceptual characteristics to the target. And that's what we mean by a, a close, correct close uh, condition. But then for the for the other 25 or so trials, um, the participants in the second task could have picked a distractor that is very dissimilar from the target in perceptual features. So it's a completely different face that they're picking. So in that sense, we've then got two conditions um, allocated this correct task one condition, um, splitting them into ones where they're repeatedly remembering similar information all they are remembering different uh, information across the two tasks. Is that, is that all right? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, think, I believe Alexa has a question. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, sorry for masquerading as someone else. Um, <laughs> it's a, a slight accident due to a, something is distracting me. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering if there's some real difference here in the kind of basic neural correlates of retrieval going on the first test and the second. Is this me or is it just because you've used these different subtractions to subtract out the the, the precise from the imprecise memory, um, and if, if if I'm right that there's a, a difference, why do you think it is? Uh, so, 
what so you, you're saying that there's there is something different going on between the two tasks just in terms of I, I guess I would have expected so like you've got the theatre synchronization and I can't quite remember what the ERPs look like for sort of old new effects like yeah. are, the, are the basic phenomena looking different in the two test phases here uh, they, they're kind of similar so this is the ERPs um, where we've got yeah. this correct incorrect so correct is is the black lines incorrect is blue uh, and they're fairly similar except for in the second task uh, in the second test there's a clear distinction in the the correct responses that have already been correctly remembered previously so we feel like um for though for that for those memories that they've correctly picked the information in the second test but um in the previous test they selected something dissimilar there's a there's less of a retrieval related correlate here because of that the fact that previously they haven't remembered it correctly they may be just simply guessing in the second test and they've just mm. luckily come across the target. Mm. Um, that's the only real difference between test one and test two there. Yeah, it's just, I, I guess the reason I asked it is just, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate and obviously to myself as well. So there's a, there was an, an, uh, an alternative interpretation of the, the parietal old new effect at a certain point that said it had more to do with people identifying a target than identifying, um, th than just recollecting. And I was just, I guess, wondering why it looked different here with that sort of, but I guess your, your account also works. So, um, and, and, the th and the theta as well, you've got the theta um, effect in just phase three, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. So um, theta is only, which like, like I said, typically associated with successful retrieval we don't see that at all in test one but it's uh, it's stronger in test two um yeah which again could be in combination with the fact that at this stage participants are now only remembering those phases that they are convinced they are repeatedly correct um yeah we 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 didn't really kind of uh go into specific like um like the left parietal effect and the, the mid frontal effect for this uh, particular task, we um, just because of the, the nature of the stimuli and like we've said, they're completely different to what uh, the type of like memories that are typically associated with the the parietal lobe new effect. This the semantically loaded information. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thank cool. You. Are there any more questions? Looks like not. Um, thank you very much again, Matt, for a oh. fascinating talk. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, there is um, no session next week. Um, the next session uh, is on November the 3rd and we're gonna have uh, talks, uh, short science talks by Maxine Sherman and Nick Dowell. Um, so uh, thank you again, Matt. So let's thank you. Have a wonderful talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs>